anti-neutrinos, their anti-partners, could hold the answer as to why that is. So they're fundamental matter particles. They're electrically neutral and very, very small. And this actually makes them extremely hard to catch, to detect, and be able to study experimentally. But we know already, we've studied them enough to know that neutrinos come in three types, called the electron neutrino, mu e, muon neutrino, mu mu, and tau neutrino, mu tau. And they were also produced in high abundances during the Big Bang. Uh, in fact, they were so abandoned, abundant that they played a significant role in the evolution of our universe and the growth of the biggest things that exist in our universe, uh, which are galaxy clusters. Um, and we can in fact measure the effects that neutrinos from the Big Bang have imprinted onto large scale structure in our universe with astronomical measurements that we make today. Um, they're also produced in supernova explosions. This is another image from the Hubble Space Telescope which shows um, the supernova 1987A. It's a, it's a star that basically had a dramatic end of its life explosion in 1987. And as a result of that explosion, it emitted enough neutrinos so that we were actually able to detect neutrinos from that supernova explosion in one of uh, the detectors that were running in Japan at the time. So a supernova explosion is a dramatic death of a big star, uh, which is typically larger than our sun. And what happens is that under large gravitational pressure, um, all the matter collapses and the large energy gets released. And it's such a highly energetic and dense environment that actually what happens is that everything within that explosion gets trapped within the star. In fact, photons become trapped during a supernova explosion. The only thing that can make it out of there quickly enough to carry out all that energy and release it is actually neutrinos. And this is only because neutrinos are so weakly interacting. They, they interact so little and they're difficult to get them to do anything. So a lot of that energy that gets released, actually the majority of it from a supernova collapse is in the form of neutrinos. And in fact, these are the brightest neutrino sources that we know of. And um, without neutrinos, this explosion, this energy release would not have been able to happen. And another thing about supernovas is that that's where some of the heavier elements are churned during violent nuclear reactions that happen during the explosion. Those are the heavy elements that are very, very critical for life today. So once again, if it wasn't for neutrinos, supernovas would not be able to take place. Um, we know that there's other astrophysical sources that produce neutrinos as well. We think that there's some that produce very, very high energy neutrinos, and we're actually actively looking for those sources today with, uh, with um, uh, an experiment called Ice Cube in the South Pole. Um, they're produced in stars. Stars are basically giant nuclear reactors, and we know that nuclear decays, nuclear reactions produce neutrinos and antineutrinos. And our closest star is the sun. So neutrinos are produced in high abundance in the sun. In fact, uh, our sun produces enough neutrinos that about 65 billion neutrinos pass through your thumbnail every second that goes by. And 
What I mentioned earlier about neutrinos being hard to catch, what that implies is that a neutrino produced in the center of the sun takes only merely two seconds to escape, as opposed to a photon, which takes about 200,000 years to, es to exit, make its way out of the sun. It's because photons interact a lot more than neutrinos. So while neutrinos can just easily pass through, photons will bounce around and go through this random walk and take forever to get out of there. Okay, nuclear reactors are actually uh, kind of like mini versions, very, very mini versions of the sun. They produce a lot of neutrinos. And actually, we uh, can study neutrinos from nuclear reactors to understand more about fuel composition and uh, the fuel burn up in nuclear reactors. So they can be, so neutrino detectors can be used for nuclear reactor monitoring. And also, our Earth contains a lot of heavy radioactive elements. So our Earth actually releases a lot of neutrinos. And there are experiments, such as the Kamland experiment in Japan, which has gone out and looked at how many neutrinos are produced uh, with the right kind of energy consistent with radioactivity as a function of um, their energy. And the data, these black points, match with the total sum of neutrinos coming from man-made reactors plus other accidental backgrounds in pink and green plus this blue contribution which actually comes from radioactivity in the Earth's um, mantle and crust. And if you know, and you know from independent measurements actually, what those background contributions are and what the uh, reactor neutrino contributions are, then you can actually use this measurement to inform models of the geoneutrino predictions uh, as, as shown in this map. So what this map shows is the flux of neutrinos per centimeter squared per second that comes out of the Earth on the Earth's surface, which is from radioactive elements like uranium and thorium in the Earth's mantle and crust. And of course, bananas. Bananas, we've established, are mildly radioactive. So the potassium that they contain, the particular isotope, potassium-40, uh, likes to decay mostly into calcium-40. And in the process, it releases an electron and uh, an antineutrino, electron antineutrino. And we also emit neutrinos uh, as a consequence, especially when we eat bananas. Okay, so neutrinos are everywhere. In fact, the neutrinos that were left over after the Big Bang are the second most abundant matter particle 